Revenue Chat Episode 67. Welcome to Revenue Chat, where I speak with the experts and provide you with actionable advice and insights. Get valuable takeaways for your rapid success at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash takeaways. Update your graphics logo or web design to get the branding you need to portray your company's best to your customers. Design Crowd can help you. Visit designcrowd.com slash chat and save up to $100 on your custom design. That's designcrowd.com slash chat. New York Times bestselling author Jay Bear's newest book, Hug Your Haters, focuses on how, where, and why people complain about the service they receive. Written as a response to the rise in online complaints, Hug Your Haters argues that the business mindset to pick and choose as to when to respond to customer criticism is an incredibly costly mistake for many businesses as today's customer service is a spectator sport. Jay tells us how to keep your customers next on Revenue Chat. Hi, everyone. This is Tony D'Urso with Revenue Chat. With us, we have Jay Baer, New York Times bestselling author of Utility, and he's back with another bombshell, Hug Your Haters, How to Embrace Complaints and Keep Your Customers. Jay spent 23 years in digital marketing, consulting for more than 700 companies during that period, including 32 of the Fortune 500. His current firm, Convince and Convert, provides digital marketing advice and online customer service advice and counsel to some of the world's most important brands like the United Nations, Allstate, Cisco, and Cabela's. A fixture in social media, Jay is the most retweeted person in the world among digital marketers and the second most retweeted person in the world among B2B marketers. He's also an active venture capitalist and is an investor or advisor to 15 early stage technology and social media companies. His website is hugyourhaters.com. All right, get ready for Jay to tell us how to hug our haters and keep our customers. Let's bring them on. Hello, Jay. How are you? Tony, I am terrific. Thanks so much for uh, connecting. Oh, great. You know, I'm very grateful to have someone on as you on our show and taking the time out to hang out with us on Revenue Chat. You're very busy out there in the social media world, I see. Well, I try and keep it interesting. Uh, there's no question about that. I, uh, you know, I'm on the road a lot as well. And it's been a crazy stretch lately. All kinds of airlines going down and people you know, not making their flight connections. It's uh, never a dull moment out there. Yep. I hear you on that. Hey, I mentioned a little bit about you in our intro, and perhaps to start off, you'd like to fill us in a little more on your roots and how you became an expert in your field. Jay, how did it all start for you? Well, I guess everybody's story is probably a little weird, right? But I think mine qualifies. I started in politics. I was a political consultant as a young professional and worked on political campaigns and uh, decided that was a tricky business to be in. And so I I left politics and got involved for uh, a few years working for a large corporation uh, in the environmental services industry. So I I gave a lot of tours of landfills, among other things. So I can tell you a lot about landfill design if we want to get into that here on Revenue chat. Did that for a while, left the trash business and worked for a very brief time uh, as a spokesman for the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections, where my job was primarily to give tours of Arizona's juvenile prisons to legislators and members of the media. Uh, And that job wasn't real fantastic either. And so I was having a couple of beers with some friends of mine from college. I went to the University of Arizona and these guys had started the very first internet company in Arizona. Now, this is circa 1993, Tony. So we're going way back on the clock as uh, in the internet calendar, 1993. And uh, they started the first company and they said, um, hey, this internet company that that we started is, is getting kind of big and we don't know anything about marketing. And I said, well, that's okay because when you say the word internet, I don't know what that word means, but I'll do anything to not give another tour of this prison. So I walked in the next day and quit, and I ended up immediately as the vice president of sales and marketing for an internet company, having never been on the internet. And that made for a very, very interesting first day at work. And and uh, fast forward 23 or four years, and I've started five companies um, in internet marketing, professional services, and written five books, and and give lots of speeches, and and uh, you know, and here we are. 
Wow, you're right. That is a very interesting uh, history. Uh, I wouldn't have expected anything like that. And uh, very humorous there about uh, taking a job and not knowing a thing about it. Obviously, you did know something about marketing because you excelled at it. Look at where you are now. I knew something about marketing, but I really didn't know anything about the internet marketing because I, I, I truly had not been online. Of course, hardly anybody had. It was, you know, in those days, we only had AOL and Prodigy and those kind of things. We really didn't have uh, the real internet, quote unquote. And, uh, and so they were really, real early into it. And we had the dial up and it took forever to get out. That's on. what we did. That was the business. We, we were in the <laughs> dial up business. So literally our business, the company was called Internet Direct. And our business back then was to get you online with dial up. So we would charge you, I think it was nineteen ninety nine or maybe twenty one ninety nine a month. And we would send you a couple of floppy disks in the mail. And that floppy disk would allow you to connect to using dial up, uh, using your modem at home uh, to the World Wide Web uh, and make that horrible screeching sound when it connected. And that's what we did. Wow. That's a blast from the past indeed, Jay. I remember those days. And now here we are circling back to present. You've got your uh, your new book out, Hug Your Haters, which is amazing. And you talk Thanks. about Yep, and you talk about embracing complaints and keeping your customers. But there's something I want to start off with. You say something that I thought was peculiar. You say customer service is a spectator sport. Can I ask what do you mean by that, please? Yeah, so like the history of customer service is primarily in private. So when customers want to interact with a business, they have for decades done so mostly, you know, either face to face, like I want to see a manager and you're standing at the front desk or via phone or via email. But now increasingly customers interact with companies in places that are public, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Yelp. TripAdvisor, Google reviews, discussion boards and forums, iTunes reviews, all of these kind of places, which are public. Everybody can see the interaction or lack of interaction between the business and the customer. And for that reason, increasingly customer service is becoming a spectator sport. In fact, in the research that I did for Hug Your Haters, we found that about 40% of all customer complaints are now in public, 40%. And, And just a few years ago, that would have been 10%. That's alarming and shocking. Oh, my goodness. That just means people are just airing out their dirty laundry, so to speak, of their service and just telling the world. All you have to do is go to Twitter and do a search for bad customer service or any sort of derivative of that, and you will see a constant real-time feed of people airing their dirty laundry for everyone else to see. Wow. What social media channel receives the most complaints? Is it Twitter? You would think, uh, because Twitter has, I wouldn't say strategically, but it sort of ended up being the place that most people go to for direct customer service assistance. And Twitter customer service is probably farther along, more codified inside many big brands. But by number, there's overwhelmingly more customer complaints on Facebook than on Twitter, according to our research. And that's just partially because so many more people use Facebook than Twitter. I mean, it's it's not even close. We, we talk about those social networks in the same sentence quite often just by habit, but Facebook now has 1.5 billion users and Twitter has about 150 million. So it's almost 10x in terms of their usage. Wow. It's very interesting because for me, my my biggest audience is on Twitter So I'm always thinking Twitter is more popular, but yes, Facebook, of course. I mean, I think everybody's on it. I mean, it's not 7 billion. Yeah, right. That's their goal. That's their goal. Everybody with electricity. There you go. Now, how does that correlate with businesses that service and cater to the public? Should they be putting more budget into handling and establishing their Facebook presence and so forth? Well, I mean, certainly from a marketing perspective, I would argue yes. But from a customer service perspective, I would argue absolutely. Because in the research, we found that about a third of all customer complaints are never answered. Ever. That much? A third? A third. And of course, if you complain and you get no response, you're essentially thinking, well, this company doesn't care about me at all. They are not concerned whether I remain as a customer or I defect to to a competitor. So maybe I should just go do that. Maybe I should go defect to a competitor. So when you don't answer a customer complaint, you are essentially, you know, ensuring that that customer will leave. But most of those customers that are ignored, most of that one third are in social media, Uh, as well as review sites, Yelp and TripAdvisor and, and, and whatever review sites might be typical in your industry. Every industry has review sites dedicated to that industry. And, and so what, what has happened is that most businesses are still thinking about customer service 
through that telephone and email prism. They're not thinking about customer service in public. They're not thinking about customer service through the prism of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, et cetera. And so consequently, Tony, they're using a 1995 playbook to try to solve 2016 customer service problems. And and that's just not going to work anymore. I see, Jay. Let me just make something up. Someone went to a restaurant, didn't like it, went on Facebook and said, hey, I went to XXX and uh, the food stinks. Now, do they really expect that restaurant to see that post and make an effort to answer it or take care of it or something like that? I'll answer that two ways. Facebook in particular is a little tricky because unless you actually tag the restaurant, they can't find it. Facebook is not searchable in the same way that Twitter is searchable. So if they just mention the restaurant, there's actually no physical, practical way that the restaurant will find it. But if they do actually mention it, they use their name and they use the at symbol and it it highlights, it makes it clickable, then the restaurant can find it. So there's that sort of technical part that that only applies to Facebook. But per the research, about half the time they expect it and about half the time they don't. Uh, what, we, what we discovered was that about 50% of the time, people who complain in social media expect a response from businesses, about 50%. Now, partially that's because they have not been trained to expect that yet because so many businesses routinely ignore complaints in social media. But the other reason is a lot of times they're complaining about a business, not at a business. But this is actually a huge opportunity, Tony, because if you in your your example is perfectly crafted, if you have a bad experience in a restaurant and you just go to your own Facebook page and you say, hey, I went to this restaurant and it wasn't any good, uh, you may not expect the restaurant to find it and, and quote unquote solve that problem. But if the restaurant is proactive and they do find it and they do reach out, they say, oh, Tony, hey, we're terribly sorry you had a bad experience. Uh, We must have had an off night. We'd love for you to come back and give us another chance. Hey, if we gave you a gift certificate, would you come back and maybe bring somebody with you who hasn't been here before and give us another shot? Now, that would blow your mind and win your heart. And we actually modeled that in the research. And we found that when you answer customers in social media who don't necessarily expect you to reply, it has a massive impact on customer loyalty. Oh, I like that. Now, on Twitter, we understand that. And on Facebook, your example and my example, the company, are they able to search periodically or do something to search to see if they have any comments about them or complaints that don't tag them or anything like that? Is that you, possible? You can't, you, yeah, it is possible. It just it, it depends on how the customer has their Facebook profile uh, privacy settings um, identified, things like that. There's a lot of massively technical nuances to how Facebook handles that. But yes, I, I think the easiest way to describe it is that is that uh, all businesses should be spending more time uh, investigating and managing their reputation in social media. Okay. As far as the customer service budget and where that company puts all their effort, how does this all correlate now? I'm also looking at your Hatrix yeah. Uh, infographic here, and I don't have it all memorized and know it backwards and forwards like you just yet. Give me a little time, but maybe well, you can kind the, of... <laughs> here's the crazy part about this, Tony. Yes. So, look, everybody listening, everybody listening to Revenue Chat knows that it makes more business sense to keep the customers that you already have than it does to constantly have to get new customers, to, to fill that metaphorical leaky bucket that we talk about in business so often. Like everybody knows that. You learn that in the first day of business. Absolutely. Nobody's nobody's going to say, no, that's not a good idea. We shouldn't try and keep customers. There, there is no other side of that argument. But we don't actually run businesses that way. We don't I mean we know it's true, but we don't run businesses that way. If you look at, at how dollars are spent each year globally, companies spend about six hundred billion dollars a year on marketing and about nine billion a year on customer service. So that tells you all you need to know about areas of emphasis and prioritization. We know it makes a lot of strategic sense and operational sense to keep our customers, to retain customers, but we don't actually spend nearly enough money to to do that. And that's because culturally, for a really long time, customer service has been a necessary evil. And that's because customer contact has been in private. We talked about the fact that customer service is a spectator sport, and that's why this whole game has changed. See, it wasn't that long ago, if you were really good at customer service, nobody would know. And if you were really bad at customer service, nobody would know. I mean, the customers you dealt with would know, but how many people could they tell? Now that every customer has a megaphone, and everybody has a Facebook page and a Twitter account and all this stuff, 
If you're great at customer service, everybody knows. And if you're terrible at customer service, everybody knows. And so we have to start thinking about customer service as the new marketing, as a way to actually create customers and build business value instead of treating customer service as the redheaded stepchild, which is how it's been treated for generations of business people. You are so right, Jay. So right. Spot on. I'm totally agreeing and nodding my head with everything you say. Correct. Now, is there an estimated budget or amount that you believe is ideal for a business to invest or or put into their customer service budget? You can't necessarily put a flat number against it because different companies have such hugely varying costs for customer acquisition. So, so if your cost for customer acquisition is high, so let's say you're a B2B software company, uh, B2B software companies will, will spend hundreds, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars in some cases, uh, to acquire a new customer. In those market dynamics, you should spend a bunch of money <laughs> trying, to keep, to, trying to keep every customer you have because replacing that customer is going to be really expensive. Conversely, if you are selling snow cones, it doesn't cost you much to get a new snow cone customer, nor is your lifetime value of a snow cone customer very significant. You probably don't need to bend over backwards to keep every customer because you can replace them at at a low net unit cost. And so it's not so much a percentage as it is a function of how hard it is for you to actually replace that customer uh, and what you can do instead of watching them walk out the door to keep them. Got it. So all the revenue chat audience here should take a look at their company in terms of customer acquisition. What does it take to get that customer and choose accordingly uh, some sort of a ratio of what they're going to put to beef up the budget? Because obviously, based on your book, your infographics here, the Hatrix and so forth, these budgets seem to be overall not as high as one would expect them to deal with the issues. And a lot of times it's labor. It's not so much... And it really is a it is a personnel cost more than anything else, right? You oh, just okay. have to be able to you have to be able to interact with customers in more places and do so more quickly. And and that's just a people budget and a training budget. Yes, there's some software necessary at scale to do social media customer service well and things like that. There's a bunch of companies that are good at that. But ultimately, you just have to put more bodies against it is is usually what happens. There's a story in the book um, of Discover Card. I think everybody probably knows that brand. Uh, they, they have credit cards, Discover Financial Services. And Discover's in a tough business because their competitors are Amex, MasterCard, and Visa. And, you know, the, the, those are three pretty heady competitors that are spending a bunch of money. Uh, Discover Card is definitely fourth place in terms of brand awareness. They're fourth place in terms of marketing spend. And, and they've always sort of struggled to find a differentiating principle. They have for a long time kind of tried to hang their hat on the cash back. You may know that, that Discover Card always gave you cash back. I think it was a percentage and a half. But now you've got some of the other credit card companies um, – you know, kind of the what's in your wallet guys, the Capital One group, uh, you know, they've got all the TV commercials with Samuel Jackson and Jennifer Garner and, you know, Charles Barkley. And they've always kind of really started to, to drive the, the cash back. And so they, they muted Discover's differentiator there. And so they said, well, what else can we do? And so they, they had this big corporate strategy meeting and said, well, okay, well, what if we just decided that we were going to be the most responsive company in the world inside the financial services industry? We'd be the best at customer service. What would that require? Like, what would that take to do that, to achieve that objective? And so they discovered you know, all kinds of audits and competitive analysis and stuff. And they said, all right, if we can answer every customer, every customer, question, complaint, praise, doesn't matter. If we could answer every question, every customer within 20 minutes in every channel, phone, email, Twitter, Facebook, skywriting, you know, doesn't matter. Within 20 minutes, we're going to answer everybody. If we could do that, we would be by far the best at customer service of any financial services company. And so they modeled what that would require, number of people, software, processes, et cetera. And they said, okay, let's go do it. So they invested a ton of money. And now that's what they do. If you tweet them, they get back to you right away. If you get them on Facebook right away, phone, email, they are the most responsive brand in customer service. They're now using TV to start to make people aware of that differentiation. Uh, and that is now their thing. And it's become the corporate principle for the brand, which I think is really interesting for somebody in financial services that you would naturally think of as a great customer service organization. I like that. That's brilliant. Hey, are you looking to improve your brand, graphics, logo, or website? Design Crowd is there for you to create custom graphics, logos, and web designs. 
Get this, they have a team of over 500,000 designers who will compete for your business, thereby giving you the absolute best design for your dollar. 500,000 designers competing for your business. I can't get over that. Just visit designcrowd.com slash chat and submit a post describing the design you need. Within hours, you start receiving designs from the professionals, all competing to give you their best. 500,000 designers? Wow. And as a listener of Revenue Chat, you get a special $100 VIP offer. That's insane. Economically priced, you can start a project from just $99. Hey, now that's off the hook. You need to get started now because this is wild. That's designcrowd.com slash chat and save $100 on your design project. That's designcrowd.com slash chat. C-H-A-T. Once again, we're here with Jay Beer talking about Hug Your Haters, How to Keep Your Customers. The website is hugyourhaters.com. And it brings up the next point I wanted to talk about is the benefits. And it seems like a no-brainer that the benefits would be amazing in terms of customer retention. Not only amazing, but, but also provable. So we're doing a consulting project right now. I have a, a consulting company as well that helps people kind of make this kind of thing happen. And we're doing a project where we're taking a company, a B2B organization, and we are splitting their customer group into two. And one customer group, we're going to handle the way they've always been handled, which is frankly somewhat blasé. Um, not overtly terrible customer service, but certainly nothing to write home about. Uh, so we're going to handle one, one group the same. And then the other group we're going to respond to more quickly with greater empathy, with greater humanity. Uh, we're not going to say, or the policy says we can't do that. We're going to yield on some common sense things, etc. And then we are going to measure the retention rate, the purchase volume, uh, etc. of both groups. And then we can determine, okay, what's the difference and is it worth it to expand it to the whole company? So that requires some effort, of course, but, but this is testable for any business. I see. Very interesting. Very interesting. This is uh, very illuminating. I used to do retention for a very large long distance company many, many years ago, dating myself as well. And back then it was just phone and email and fax, but also the, the indicator of my job was to keep our customers with us. And if they didn't use their phones or there was a change, then I would proactively contact them to see if they switched or whatever. I used yeah. that as a form of communication. And I kept with my department, the attrition rate below 2%, which was quite amazing considering yeah, all of the competition we had back then. So yes, and that was just simply answering every communication. So just the fact of just answering anything that's there, any way you can find it is bound to just boost you up in terms of retention just by that simple fact. Oh, you nailed it. You nailed it. And, and sometimes where businesses start to freak out about this, so they say, well, look, sometimes we can't solve the customer's problems. They, they've got an issue that we can't fix. And, and what I always say is that that's okay. The, the, what the research shows, and your personal experience demonstrates it as well, is that in most cases, you don't have to solve the problem. You just have to acknowledge their right to complain. Hearing the customer is what matters, not solving the problem. And in fact, uh, research that wasn't performed by me, but research I cited in the book says that answering a customer, not solving, just answering, keeps that customer 70% of the time doing nothing else other than saying, we heard you. Exactly. Even in a negative scenario where something bad happens, I believe, and of course you may have, I'd like you to comment on it, is there... Any time that you think a company should not respond, should not say, hey, I didn't hear you, but, well, that would be kind of silly, where they just shouldn't respond to any negative feedback. I think the only time that you do not respond is if the customer is so outlandish and over the line that you might possibly get law enforcement involved. And I've been involved in a few of those scenarios in my life, not too many, thankfully. But, but if you're like, you know what, this person is making threats, this person is, is, is saying things where we're a little bit concerned about the safety of our employees, things like that, then no, you document and you talk to law enforcement. But beyond that, I think you respond every time. And what people always say to me is, well, Jay, why would we spend our time answering a troll? Why would we spend time answering somebody who's using profanity or being inappropriate in some way? And I say, well, there's two reasons. One, everybody can see whether you do or do not answer. And second, when you do answer and you fight crazy with logic, it actually demonstrates to anybody else who wants to try and play that game with you 
that it doesn't work, that you won't, you won't let them get your goat, right? You just say, oh, well, we're terribly sorry we had you to the experience, and you handle them just like any other customer. It, it is a much better way uh, to, to deal with that kind of marginal group is to answer them once and then get out. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very well said and correct. Right on. Now, in your research, is there anything that's very startling that you've determined or well, very shocking? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that are, that are interesting um, in, in the research. I mean, certainly the fact that 80% of, of companies say that they deliver exceptional customer service and only 8% of their customers agree is really shocking. That is a research that Bain put together a year or so ago. So, so almost every company thinks they're great at customer service. No customers think that's true. So, so that is a pretty shocking difference. That's alarming. Uh, I would, it's alarming. It, that's the perfect word, it is truly alarming. And that's because most companies have skated by with average customer service for a long, long time. And now you have to bring more to the table than, than average. I would say that one of the other things that was really interesting in the research is how hard it is to exceed expectations in traditional customer service. Like you have to do it, but it's really hard to gain any traction. So what I mean by that is when we did the research, we, we asked customers, thousands and thousands of people, how they feel about a brand before and after they complain, before and after they got an answer, before and after they got their problem solved. Uh, and we asked them that by channel. So if you complained on the phone, how'd you feel? If you complained on Facebook, how'd you feel? Like, what we discovered is that if you answer a customer's complaint uh, on the phone or via email, you get a very, very small increase in customer loyalty and customer advocacy. And that's because customers expect you to do that. Like we have trained customers to expect businesses to answer the phone. We've trained customers to expect businesses to respond to email. So when you do that, they're like, well, yeah, it's kind of like, when you turn on the light switch in your office, you're not like, wow, there's light now. Like you're just not, you're, you're just not that enthusiastic, right? You've come to expect it. And so you don't really get much credit for doing that. But here's the hard part. If you don't, if you don't answer the phone or you don't answer an email, the decrease in customer loyalty and advocacy is significant. It's as much as 50%. So, so you don't get any benefit for doing a good job. You get totally punished for doing a bad job. Now, in the new customer service, social media, Yelp, TripAdvisor, all those places, it's the exact opposite, right? You, you get massive credit for doing a good job, and you get a little bit of penalty for doing a bad job. Wow. And I'm looking at your map here. For the audience, if you go to HugYourHaters.com, there is something called the Hatrix, which is an the info Hatrix. The Hatrix, which is an infographics, and it's divided into two sections with off-stage haters. And you can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but these are people that phone or email their complaint or problem that expect to be answered. And then there's the on-stage haters, which will go on social media, which is varied and numbered, and say, "Hey, that place really stinks," or whatever. He, that's Jay, <laughs> has it all broken down by percent of social media, those who expect the response. It, this is just an amazing, amazing grid. If any company, any executive, any CEO, anyone in customer service just looked at this grid, just look at it, you will immediately see, oh, I should do this. I should do that. Here's a hole in my business. I should plug it. It immediately gets the uh, thought process going. It, it's quite something. And this matrix are some of the items that we've talked about are right on this one visual it's not page turning. It's not pages and pages. It's just one simple visual. Very nice graphic, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, I was really happy that my publisher, Penguin Portfolio, uh, allowed me to, to essentially put a poster uh, in, in every book. And so inside every copy of Hug Your Haters, you get the color version of the Hatrix and all the data. And so the idea is that you can uh, tear that out of your book and, and, uh, and keep it on your desk or on the, the wall of your office, those kind of things. And so I was really happy that they allowed me to do that. I think it kind of gives you a lot of the, the, the key pieces that you need and puts it all in one place. Very good. All right. Well, we've talked about the complaints. I want to flip it to the other side. Proactive. What can businesses do to proactively keep their customers? Have you run into anything in your research of simple things or good things that businesses can do that they're not that would keep the complaints down? Well, the best way to keep complaints down is to, is to really fix the problem. I, I did a I did a webinar uh, a couple months ago, Tony, and, and it was for a chain of uh, preschools. 
And everybody on the webinar were owners of preschools. And I, I talked about Hug Your Haters and, and a lot of the things we've touched on. And at the end, we had Q&A. And somebody said, Jay, how do we get fewer negative reviews? And I said, well, the best way to do that would be to run a better preschool. And sometimes it's not any more complicated than that. And, and, but here's, here's where, where the hug your haters approach comes into play. Uh, we talked about the benefits of doing this. Certainly there's an economic benefit, which is keeping your customers, retaining more customers, reducing churn, all those kind of things. But the other benefit is operational, which has the byproduct of eventually also reducing churn. And so, Tony, the most overrated thing in business is praise. Praise is totally overrated. When somebody says, oh, you're great at this, you're going to love the show, whatever, it makes you feel terrific. But you don't learn anything from that because in almost every case, we already know what we're good at. What makes us better business people, what makes us better businesses, which makes us better human beings is, is negative feedback and criticism. So if you want to, to get better at business, you actually want people to complain. You want as many people to complain as possible, which sounds really crazy, but you got to understand that only 5% of unhappy customers ever complain to the business. 5%. So the overwhelming majority of unhappy customers never say a thing. They just disappear. They just stop giving you money. And if you've ever sort of been in a conversation with somebody, this happens in restaurants a lot. Hey, whatever happened to Bob? Bob used to come in every Wednesday for a sandwich. Well, Bob was probably dissatisfied and never told you about it, and Bob just disappeared. And so what you want to try to do is get more complaints than ever. I could tell you a story about that if you'd like. I would love it. And that's very, very smart, by the way. And I didn't realize that it was so such a low percentage. But when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Yes, please go ahead. Well, and, and so because it's such a low percentage, we have to treat people who complain, the haters, if you will, we need to treat those people like our most important customers. But yet we routinely treat them like our least important customers. And a lot of businesses, especially small businesses, are guilty of this transgression, which is, well, if they're not happy, then we don't want them as a customer. Right? That's the default psychology, which is a very dangerous way to run your business. So the story I want to tell you is about uh, La Pan Quotidienne. And uh, La Pan Quotidienne is a chain of bakeries and cafes. They've got 220 locations uh, based in Brussels, many locations in the U.S. There's some in New York, uh, in the Northeast. There's some in California. Uh, there's one in Indianapolis, which is about an hour from where I live. And their director of customer service, customer uh, guest relations, I think is her actual title, is Erin Pepper. Erin's really smart. And when she started there two years ago, she said, my goal is to triple the number of complaints that we get. I want to triple the number of complaints, which sounds crazy, right? But she understands that if I get more complaints, I can figure out what we're doing that's not perfect. I can then fix those things. So what she did is she audited all the different ways that the business interacts with the customer. Email, social media, receipts, what do the people say at the cash register, what's the signage in the restroom, table tents, all that kind of stuff. She audited every customer touch point. And in each of those customer touch points, she built in nudges for feedback. So all over the restaurant, it's we want to know what you think, good or bad, and we want to know in any form or fashion that you prefer. You can text us, you can call us, you can Facebook us, you can email us, you can, you can send us a letter, you can do whatever you want. Uh, and, and so they did this initiative, and they got way more complaints, and they also got way more praise. But then they were able to mine those complaints and analyze those complaints and find a bunch of things that they were doing that were just slightly off that, that didn't really ever surface uh, before. But, but at scale, they're like, oh, right. Yeah, we should. That's, I understand. We could probably fix that. And then, of course, the complaints went way, way down because they addressed them. So the easiest way to describe this, Tony, is that the best way to get fewer complaints is to first get more complaints. You know, it's, that is very wise and sage. And at first it's like, what are you talking about? What are you crazy? But yes, as you explained it, it was like, of course, most people don't say anything. They just don't visit an establishment again because they're dissatisfied, but they won't say anything. And here they have the opportunity to say something and they get into that, oh, what the hell? I'll just tell them I don't like the way that they make XXX or whatever. And that really changes things. Very clever. Very clever. Well, and it's got to be easy. It's got to be yes. easy for the customer. And that's why this whole hug your haters uh, formula and customer service disruption is so important because, yeah, look, I get it, right? It's easier for businesses to do phone and email because they already have an infrastructure in place to do phone and email. But the reality is that customers are increasingly preferring 
social media and other places for everything, to interact with businesses, to buy flowers, to listen to radio, whatever. And and, and your business isn't going to change that. So you have to eventually, and I think now, start to embrace complaints in the channels that customers prefer instead of embracing complaints in the channels that the business uh, prefers. And you think about young customers. I mean, I've got two teenagers at home. Uh, today was the first day of school. Uh, my daughter's a senior. My son's a sophomore. They don't use the phone ever. Phone, phone what's ever, that? <laughs> right? And they don't email either. They hate email. So you think about, you know, you, you future cast this out a little ways. Uh, and if it's still known as the call center in your business, you're going to have to make some changes. And I mean now, because pretty soon nobody's going to call. And then what? Well said, because the younger generation, the millennials and all the other generations, it's social media. It's a whole different thing. The, the world is morphed and you have to change with it. Otherwise, you become a dinosaur. Now, you have this great course, I believe, Keep Your Customers course. Do you talk about retention there and any other tidbits yeah. there you talk about Thanks. on retaining? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So the Keep Your Customers course is keepyourcustomerscourse.com. It's sort of the course version of the book. So the things that we're talking about here, but expanded into a, a very detailed uh, course. And so we have uh, eight modules, 50 videos, 119-page workbook, an exclusive Facebook group for people who uh, who enroll in the course and, and all kinds of private uh, sessions with my team and I. And so it really is the ultimate uh, kind of training program for all of this modern customer service disruption. And so we, we go step by step, the best way to handle complaints uh, on the phone or email, step by step, the best way to handle complaints in social media, et cetera. Uh, so we're really proud of it, it, that we put a ton of time and effort into it and, uh, and folks are learning a lot. Very good. And for the audience, if you go to Hug Your Haters, there is a link as well there for the course, but you could also go to the URL that he just said. Keep your customers course.com. Did I say that right? That's right. Keep your customers course.com. Very, very good. Now, Jay, you're prolific. You're a multi New York Times bestselling author. You've written books on other subjects. I have not read all your books. Sorry. So you have this view of the world. You have this view of where you're going and what you're doing. Can you share that with us? Where are you going? What do you want to change in this world? What drives you? You're not finished yet. You're maybe at the halfway mark. I don't know. Tell us about your future plans and visions, please. I really am honored by the opportunity to help people make their businesses better. And I've got books that are about getting customers, right? That are about, that are about marketing. And now I've got a book about customer service, keeping customers. And that's kind of how our consulting practice is oriented as well. We have getting customer services and we have keeping customer service. I have getting customer speeches and keeping customer speeches and, and books as well. But with the hug your haters approach, my vision is this, Tony. If I ask you right now uh, and everybody listening, just do this as a mental exercise. What companies are really, really good at customer service? Now, everybody listening can come up with two or three and we'll come up with two or three. It'll pop into your head like that. You'll just come up with them. And the reason that's true is that companies that are great at customer service are so rare that they are instantly memorable. You can pull them out of your head without any prompting. My vision is that with this book and the course and the things I'm talking about today, that if I ask you 18 months from now, Tony, what companies are really good at customer service, you won't be able to give me an answer. Because so many businesses will now have embraced the principles of Hug Your Haters. They'll be answering every complaint in every channel every time that you, they will no longer stand out. Everybody will be great at customer service. Now, the reality is it's not going to happen because a lot of businesses still don't understand that this is important, that this makes you money, that this saves you money. Uh, but that's my vision, that everybody's great at customer service. I like it. I love it. And I look forward to sharing that and seeing that that occurs as well. I like that. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, we are close to wrapping up, Jay. Is there anything else that you would like our audience to know about, please? Well, I, I would just say that, that it is critical to not just understand customer service operationally and, and do some of the things that we recommend in the book that we've talked about here, but that a lot of this requires a cultural embrace. There's a lot of companies that, that know how to do this, 
but they don't really, really believe in their heart that that keeping customers is important. They don't really, really believe in their heart that that the customer you know should be given the benefit of the doubt, etc. And so make sure that if you're going to try and walk this path and get better at customer service, that you actually believe it. It, it has to be in the DNA of your organization at some level, and that's unfortunately not always uh, not always easy. But the book will help you. You can get the book all the ways and places that books are available. It's an audio book as well, read by me. And I'll tell you one thing, Tony. Per the thesis of the book, if anybody. Uh, has any feedback, I answer all the reviews on Amazon and everywhere else. But if anybody doesn't like the book, this hasn't happened yet, but if anybody doesn't like the book, I will refund 100% of your money. You just let me know. Very, very good. And to that, I'll say, if you don't like the book, please let Jay know. He wants to hear from you. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, thank you very, very much, Jay. I learned a lot. It's been great. It's an honor to have you on the show. I really deeply thank you. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. We'll do it again. Great. And once again, everyone, it's Jay Beer, and his website is HugYourHaters.com. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and stay tuned to our next show on Revenue Chat. Listen to my other awesome interviews at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash radio. And please drop me a message. I'd love to hear from you. All right. Thanks again, everyone. And until next time, remember, you can make life better for yourself and everyone. Choose wisely.